Good evening, everyone. Thank you all, each and every one, so much for joining us tonight. Um, there, there is a wonderful crowd of you, and it's wonderful to know that so many of you are interested to know more about a woman who died almost exactly 200 years ago, the peculiar Eleanor Code. We have no known portrait of her, so I hope you'll forgive my avatar, the doorknob she chose for Belmont, her seaside villa. She died on the 18th of November, 1821, and the Baptist magazine recorded her passing thus. She had been more than 29 years a most benevolent, useful member of the Reverend James Upton's church, Church Street Blackfriars. Her end was peace. She died looking for the mercy of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And perhaps at the end, that was all Mrs. Code sought. Her Baptist faith had been important throughout her long life. A chance remark in a letter from a sarcastic clerk and distant relation in 1795 expressed doubt, quote, about the extent of the bounty of Mrs. C. She is too great a saint to have many new feelings for poor relations, which seems a little unfair when she just arranged a post for a young cousin at the East India Company and sent £10 to cover his travel expenses from Devon to London. She died at number 89 Camberwell Grove, where she lived her last years after moving from Great Blackfriars Road sometime after 1811. Intriguingly, William Gilchrist thought it worth recording her home address in his life of William Blake. And there is a theory that Code gave employment to the young Blake when he was living at Hercules Buildings near the Lambeth Manufactory in the 1780s by commissioning him to engrave plates of her manufactory's best pieces, such as this one of her famous river god, an example of which still stands at Ham House. The Gentleman's Magazine gives us a more recognisable account of her achievements in her obituary. In her 89th year, Mrs Eleanor Code, sole inventor and proprietor of an art which deserves considerable notice, in 1769, a burnt artificial stone manufactory was erected by Mrs. Code at King's Arm Stairs, Narrow Wall, Lambeth. This manufactory has been carried on from that time to the present on a very extensive scale, being calculated to answer every purpose of stone carving, having a property peculiar to itself of resisting the frost and consequently retaining that sharpness in which it excels every kind of stone sculpture and equals even marble itself. When I first read that obituary a decade or so ago now, discovering code myself for the first time, I was rather excited by it. It seemed an unexpected place to find such a long and extensive tribute to a woman and a woman in business at that, surely someone exceptional. What I didn't realise at first was that this tribute was simply quoting verbatim from John Nichols' History and Antiquities of the Parish of Lambeth, who was himself quoting at length from nothing other than Code's own publicity material, the descriptive catalogue published in 1784, and giving her a uniquely lengthy free advert in his otherwise scholarly tome. And there are other inaccuracies in the obituary. Code did not erect the artificial burnt stone manufactory she took over in Lambeth in 1769, and nor was she the sole inventor of the firm's proprietorial composition. Certainly, her life's achievements warranted such mention, but her obituary is a suitable example of the challenges faced by anyone researching the truth of her life. Her chief legacy remains her remarkable architectural stoneware in statuary and architectural embellishments still around us today, and it has become increasingly well known. But Code's personal record is virtually non-existent, and so as a person she remains a frustratingly shadowy figure. She fashioned her own mythology so successfully that in a sense, we all still fall for it today. So tonight, rather than offering you a long list of her increasingly well-recorded products or a detailed narrative of the dates and facts of her life, I'd like instead to scrutinize the evidence 
for a sense of Mrs. Code as a person. For all her achievements, you will look for Code in vain in the indices of non-architectural accounts of the 18th century. As a never married, self-made woman who created a firm of national importance, Code is a statistical aberration in the Georgian period. She sits uncomfortably outside the more conventional tropes of wives and widows in business that typically preoccupy historians of middling women. And it's remarkable how little attention has been paid to Code's achievements in trade by historians of women in business in the 18th century. Studies in material and visual culture rarely include architecture, and Code is either relegated to a passing mention in a footnote or else omitted altogether. For example, Nicola Phillips wrote an otherwise seminal book on women in business, which includes an analysis of London's fire insurance records, a very useful source for the time. Code undoubtedly lurks anonymously in Phillips' sample years for the insurance records. She will be one of the 3% of female policyholders who insured for more than a thousand pounds and Code was insuring her premises for considerably more than this. But Code is never given the detailed case study her career as a businesswoman deserves. So while I'll begin by providing a brief recap of the facts of Code and her professional achievements, I then want to turn to so far unscrutinized documents in an attempt to get a better sense of Code's personality and business practice through her will, through an eyewitness account of a visit to her manufactory in 1771 by George III's architect, Sir William Chambers, on behalf of Horace Walpole, and finally, through the transcript of the only surviving letter written by Code herself. The standard reaction from those who've heard of Code is to mention the work of the late Alison Kelly. In 1990, Kelly published half a lifetime's work in this book, bringing Eleanor Code back to public attention. The book is a gazetteer of hundreds of Code Stone items, many surviving, but many more lost, not to decay or fire, but to demolition or bombing during the Blitz. This remains the Bible on Code. But there's also a great deal more to be said about Code and her context, which promises to dispel several accumulated myths and inaccuracies about her life and work. As Teresa has said, I first came to Code's work as part of the Landmark Trust project team that restored Belmont in Lyme Regis. And by now, I suspect it's familiar to many of you. As you can see, the front elevation is a veritable billboard for Code stone decoration. And after a mere steam cleaning, it is again as bright and crisp as the day it came out of the kiln. Here's another code avatar, a window keystone from Belmont. We might notice in passing that it shares with the door no knocker a nose that is a little too large for classical beauty. Of course, I have no evidence for suggesting that Code indulged in the jeu d'esprit of using her own image on her house. But even so, this keystone at least encapsulates her business achievement. From the sponges and seaweed in the headdress, we can plausibly identify her as the sea goddess Amphritite, wife of Neptune, who himself presides over the front door. Amphritite is unmistakably a face from the second half of the 18th century. And this is what makes the figurative code stone wares so intriguing. Many are classical in inspiration, yet bring a contemporary twist, here in the knotted plaits and the lace collar. And note too how a standard base mask can be dressed with different accessories to, di to represent different allegorical personifications. And note the level of detail still apparent in the lace collar and the sponges, even after two centuries of seaside weather. All are characteristic of code, the Code firm's output. So who was Eleanor Code? An entrepreneur, purveyor of artificial stone and marketing genius. She was born in 1733, elder daughter of George Code and his wife, also called Eleanor. George was a dissenter 
a Baptist, and at first a prosperous fuller or wool finisher. His wife was an Enchmarch, part of an extended Dorset Devon family of similarly minded people active in the wool and linen trade. Cousins and aunts and uncles abounded. But the wool trade was declining. George Code went bankrupt in 1759 and moved with his family to London. They stayed first in Charterhouse Square, probably in the house of a fellow Baptist, and then in Charles Square in Hoxton. Eleanor the Younger, then in her 20s, set up as a linen draper initially, a common enough occupation for women at the time. Then in 1769, George went bankrupt a second time and died. And also in 1769, the two Eleanors, mother and daughter, suddenly went into business with one Daniel Pincott, manager for at least seven years already of an artificial stone manufactory at King's Arms Stairs, Narrow Wall, Lambeth, where the Haywood Gallery now stands. By 1791, the manufactory was famous enough for John Eddy to include it as a detail in his view of Westminster Bridge. In 1769, however, according to the fire insurance records, Eleanor the Younger is found living at Mr. Denmar's opposite the Lying Inn Hospital in Bridge Row, Lambeth, very close to the manufactory. This may be an interesting connection. Denmar was John Emmanuel Demar, a wax modeler and a director of the Society of Artists. Kelly suggests he may have been Code's tutor, but this seems unlikely as there is no firm evidence of Mrs. Code ever having sculpted herself. Nor is there any evidence in Code's life to date of romantic involvement with a man. Her presence at this address seems more likely to have been one of convenience to be close to her new venture. The code version of the story, stated in her publicity material and much quoted since, as we've heard, is that she and her mother took on a failing artificial stone manufactory, so probably less well maintained than we see here in 1802. Whether they put money into the business is unclear, as is where any such funds came from, given the recent bankruptcy of George Code. In 1766, when they were still living in Hoxton, Code had insured linen stock to the value of £200 with the Sun Assurance Company, a respectable but not huge sum to fund the purchase of or take a major share in a manufactory. And just to address quickly what Code Stone actually was, it is a stoneware constituted of a base matrix of ball clay to which is added 20% of grog, that's to say finely ground pre-fired material. And this helped regulate the shrinkage in both the drying and the kiln firing. To this ball clay were added five to 10% each of crushed flint and fine quartz and 10% of crushed lime soda glass, all well-known and widely available materials. The soda glass almost certainly the waste products of the South Bank bottling and glass grinding industries. These last constituents vitrified during the high temperature firing to give the stone its durability after firing. The mixture was stiff enough to press into a mold and to take an astonishing level of detail. Once, it, once fired, it becomes a pale buff color that depending on the size of the aggregate can closely mimic natural stone in appearance. Code's trade card personifies the entire brand positioning in allegorical form. Fire protects architecture from the ravages of father time, while three nymphs shelter coyly in the kiln as they're fired, standing on a Corinthian capital. The design is attributed to the sculptor John Bacon, and it became a recognisable symbol of the firm, the text adapted as Mrs. Code's business partners came and went, and plagiarised as late as the 1860s by those who claimed to be her successors. Commentators then and now have tended to conflate this moment of Code taking on the manufactory with her so-called 
sole event invention of this ceramic material, parroting the misapprehension that the code firm encouraged in the 18th century. However tempting this is for her iconography, any such lone invention by code herself is demonstrably untrue. Rather, she arrived in the fired artificial stone sector just as a century of painstaking artisanal development of stoneware technology had finally come to fruition. Others, all men, had been producing such products since the 1720s, albeit with varying degrees of technical and market success. Daniel Pincott, whose manufactory code took over, had already been in the artificial stone business for at least a decade in his own right. The site of the Lambeth manufactory was owned by Jesus College Oxford, whose records reveal that Pincott had been leasing the site since at least 1762. He also already had a reliable artificial stone composition, and in 1770 he published an essay on artificial stone that openly discussed all its secrets and benefits. He had, for example, supplied already a copy of the famous Borghese vase in artificial stone for Robert Adam at Kedleston Hall. This is clearly a highly sophisticated object, and it was judged a very fine performance at the Society of Arts in 1771. If Pincott's manufactory was failing, it must have been failing only financially. However, within months, Eleanor Code had very publicly sacked Daniel Pincott, angered that he was still carrying out such commissions in his own name with no reference to her as his new partner, and perhaps also by the publication of his book. In an astonishing reverse takeover, in 1771, in September, she took out the first of several adverts in the Dahlia Advertiser to announce that Pincott had no further employ at her manufactory and that in future all orders were to be sent to her. Ruthlessness, then, must clearly be noted as one of her characteristics, but, other, but otherwise another mystery about Code's life remains how, aged around 40, she thus springs apparently fully formed with such business competence and confidence. What's clear is that within a couple of years, it was Code who was running the manufactory and its workforce. She quickly earned the courtesy title of mistress or missus, even though she never married. Her mother, initially named in the takeover, soon fades from involvement. And why did Code Stone become so successful in the Georgian era? Well, Eleanor Code had astutely identified an underfulfilled sector in the Georgian obsession with replicated sculpture and the neoclassical style popularized by Robert Adam. The market gap was also driven, however, by a problem with the performance of English limestone in external statuary. This statue of George II, erected in 1735 at the old Royal Naval College in Greenwich, exemplifies the issue. This is what happens to many natural stones in the acidic rain of a city dependent upon coal fires. The space has melted away and become unrecognisable. Because code stone is a fired ceramic stoneware, it is indeed superior to natural stone in its weather resistance and this made it ideal for external sculpture and architectural detail, a product advantage that Mrs. Code pressed home at every turn in her promotion of it. And having sacked Pincott, Code engaged instead as the manufacturer's superintendent, a fellow dissenter, young porcelain modeler turned sculptor in his early thirties called John Bacon. This too was a very astute move as Bacon was previously employed by none other than Daniel Pincott after being first apprenticed to the porcelain pioneer, Nicholas Crisp. Immensely prolific, John Bacon developed into one of the leading and most interesting fine art sculptors of the period. Entirely self-taught and almost certainly already 
associated with the Lambeth manufactory when Code took it on, he brought with him a keen understanding of the fired stone process, as well as a lifelong commitment to the dissemination of art through manufacture. This huge code stone statue at Ham House, designed by Bacon, is nine feet long. Imagine firing that. John Bacon was associated with the code manufactory for 30 years until his death in 1799, and his designs of gently animated classicism provided much of the firm's sculptural output in these early years. For her part, Code helped popularise Bacon's own work among a wider audience, making them available in multiple sizes. No room for a statue of Flora standing six feet tall. Mrs Code could equally supply one at four foot six or even one foot eight, given a bronze finish if you like. And thus affordable sculpture came in from aristocratic great houses, parks and rooftops to the libraries and parlours of the affluent middle classes. Initially, as we saw on her trade card, Code called the composition lithodipera, a made-up Greek word meaning twice fired. Unsurprisingly, within a few years, the product came, became much better known as simply as Codestone. By adopting her own name with such self-confidence as an unambiguous logo and brand name to describe her manufactured wares, Eleanor Code was an early brand pioneer in the truest sense, ahead of all her contemporaries, except the far-sighted Josiah Wedgwood, and the first woman to use her own name as a brand in the modern sense. Reliable rates of shrinkage in the kiln and rigorous quality control meant that replicated items could be ordered with confidence from catalogue sheets of etchings published in the 1770s and 80s, and later from the exhibition catalogue for Code's Gallery, which she opened in 1799, admittance one shilling. By the 1780s, the Code manufacturer's wares had achieved dominance in the market for external sculptural and architectural embellishment that so transformed late Georgian architecture, and she saw off all her competitors in this sector. Code's success lay in positioning and promoting her product so that it became actively preferred to natural stone for durability, price and reliability of execution. So to achieve such preeminence, Code clearly had to interact very effectively with the male world of architecture and the building trades. When John Bacon died in 1799, Code went into partnership with her much younger relation, John Seeley, and the firm became Code and Seeley. It was at the height of its success in these years, the redoubtable Mrs. Code by now in her 60s, a successful managing director and the owner of several build-to-let properties. In 1799, as I mentioned, in a development called Codes Row on the south bank of Westminster Bridge, the firm opened its own showroom, masquerading as a gallery. It's long since demolished, but you'll note the sculptural version of its frontage on the trade card. We can get a sense of how impressive it looked from Schoenberg House on Pall Mall, where two of the same superbly modelled herms were also used. The firm continued to go from strength to strength, successfully navigating changes in taste, its modellers equally at home in any idiom, whether neoclassical, Gothic or Egyptian. And in 1810, they were commissioned by public subscription to produce the astonishing Nelson pediment on the old Royal Naval College in Greenwich, a 40 foot long masterpiece modelled by Charles Pansetta, based upon Benjamin West's immortality of Nelson. There could be no greater accolade of Code and her manufacturer's achievement. This epic poem in fired stone took two years to complete as Mrs. Code turned 80. Also in 1812, her partner John Seeley died, aged 64. Code took on another distant relative as her partner, William Crogan, then in his mid-30s. Mid 
And while Code clearly took over the day-to-day -day run, well, Crogan, sorry, clearly took over the day-to-day -day running of the manufactory, we can sense Mrs. Code's firm will behind the fact that during her remaining years, the firm's name reverted from Code and Seeley to simply Code. Her own signature appears less and less on the bills and invoices, even though, ironically, the only day books that survive from the manufactory date from Crogan's involvement after 1813. The South Bank Lion is Crogan's most famous work, done just before his bankruptcy in the late 1830s, as he ultimately failed to continue the legacy of the Code Manufactory. Let's now turn to Mrs. Code's will, which provides a detailed snapshot of her personal networks, the closest we come to a glimpse of her non-professional interests. She left assets of almost £9,000. Today, that would be in excess of half a million. So she ended her life well off into what we might call a middling degree. She divided her assets among 73 separate beneficiaries, demonstrating a wide, clubbable network of friends, relations, and favorite causes. Indeed, one feels for her executors in the rather obsessive details of the bequests. Half of these bequests were to women, and some have interpreted the fact that Code specifies the onward route of such bequests through the female line as marking her out as a proto-feminist. In fact, this practice was not uncommon in wills made by men as well as women at the time, a means perhaps of circumventing the common law doctrine of coverture, which created the legal fiction that husband and wife were the same person for their ownership of property, that person being understood, of course, to be the husband. Code's most generous bequests were to her faithful servant, Hannah Wooten, to whom she left £2,600 in annuities for life. This has been interpreted by some as indicating a preference for her own sex. Historian of women's history, Margaret Hunt, for example, notes that Code was never married and lived most of her life with her long-term housekeeper, to whom she ultimately left their home. I haven't been able to determine the basis for the statement that Code lived most of her life with Hannah, nor is there ev any evidence that it was their house, i.e. jointly owned. It was the contents of the house that Mrs. Code in fact left to Hannah. All her real estate she left to her executors to absolutely sell and dispose of the same for the best price or prices that can or may reasonably be had or gotten. Code also left lesser but still generous requests to three other former female servants. And we must not forget that Hannah is described as my faithful servant in the will, not as others were, my friend or even my very dear friend. As ever, we must be careful of jumping to unsubstantiated conclusions. The will also demonstrates that Code clearly knew her own way around her finances or else had taken detailed advice. Her instructions about annuities and stocks often specified their destination beyond the death of the immediate legatee, or in a couple of cases, appointed an intermediary who was to administer regular income for the less competent. She so shows great concern for lesser relatives and a highly developed sense of charitable giving and has a knack for pious expression. While favouring dissenting churches, she left legacies to Christian churches and societies of all denominations, chiefly but not exclusively in London and Lyme Regis. Bible societies and charity and Sunday schools were other favourite causes. She emerges from her will as a competent, engaged, busy, controlling woman with a wide set of friends, relatives and acquaintances. In short, exactly what one would expect of a successful entrepreneur. And let, let's now turn to a key glimpse of this entrepreneurial skill, provided by an eyewitness account of a visit to the code manufactory by William Chambers in 1772, three years after code's takeover. <laughs> 
It provides our only glimpse of code in action, and it's worth summarizing here for the light it sheds on code's character. In brief, in 1769, Horace Walpole had commissioned a pair of Gothic gateposts in artificial stone for the grounds of his Strawberry Hill house in Twickenham. Standing 13 feet high and based on Bishop William de Luda's 13th century tomb in Ely Cathedral, these were incredibly intricate and challenging pieces to fire in a kiln. The initial order was placed with Daniel Pincott, just as Code was going into initial partnership with him. Though pleased with the finished result, Walpole, as was his wont, challenged the manufactory on their cost. The manufactory had charged Walpole over £175 for the gate piers, and Walpole considered this too much. By May 1772, he and the manufactory were in dispute, and Walpole engaged William Chambers, architect to George III, and one of the best regarded architects of the day, to investigate. According to his letter book, on the 26th of May, 1772, William Chambers wrote briskly to Mrs. Code. Mr. Walpole insists upon you, your choosing a person to meet me in order to settle the dispute between you. Appoint therefore whoever you think proper, and I will meet them at your house any evening about five the beginning of next week. This was a serious challenge to the fledgling code firm, and at very short notice at that. Chambers' report on his subsequent visit to the code manufactory on Monday the 8th of June 1772 with Kemble Watley as Mrs. Code's chosen representative gives the only known eyewitness account of the manufactory's working practice under Code, another professional's detailed commentary of her business practice. Chambers' report on the visit reveals much about Code's practice business practice and character. First of all, for all Walpole's insistence via Chambers upon your choosing a person to meet me in order to settle the dispute, Mrs. Code herself was present at the meeting and politely engaged with the two men as an equal. Then there is the Mr. Watley she engaged as her friend in the dispute. Kemble Watley was a Lambeth neighbour and a well-established carpenter and timber merchant. He was a wealthy man known to the Office of Works and with a history of government employment stretching back decades. As a person fully au fait with architectural contracts and practice, he was an ideal mediator for code and the fact that she was able at very short notice to introduce such an ally is an interesting illustration of her existing network of contacts even at this early stage. As a man dealing in timber, Watley was also a reliable witness in, in, in assessing the cost of the kiln firing. Chambers also enclosed a detailed account of the cost with his, letter, with his letter, both as declared by code and as assessed by himself and Watley after their visit. Code was thus able to open up fully, not just the manufactory itself, but also its detailed financial records, essential in keeping track of any business. The accounts reveal the many stages of production and the meticulous craft processes involved beyond even what Chambers expected. He wrote, the wages for modeling ornaments, molding and repairing seem to us incredible. But he adds, she produced a book wherein a regular account of time was kept, which had all the marks of authenticity. Mrs. Clo Code clearly understood accounting and cash flow, and also the importance of probity and quality control in building a successful business. It seems most likely that she had learnt such skills from involvement with her father's business in Exeter. Dissenters set up their own academies for girls as well as boys, and it was common for the women in a family business to look after the accounting side, helped by the various accounting manuals published from the early part of the century. And there is also a degree of negotiation in her encounter with Chambers. 
Though Chambers cuts the fee of the subcontracted maker of the original model by almost half, Code is judged to have met charged fairly for the mould. Chambers and Watley defer to her judgment on the cost of raw materials and express surprise that she charges less than Plaster of Paris. And there's one more fascinating, if cryptic, element in the cost comparison Chambers and Watley supplied, supplied to Walpole, because it includes Pincott's attendance. Bear in mind that this meeting takes place almost a year after Code had so publicly sacked Pincott, and almost a year after the delivery of the gate piers. At some £23, this is a relatively large item and suggests that Pincott had indeed overseen the production and perhaps also been called in to attend site meeting. Pincott's fee is slashed in half by Chambers, no doubt rubbing further salt into the wound of his dismissal. Either Code was using Pincott the employee as a scapegoat, or even if she'd sacked him, she had not so completely burnt bridges to rule out his continued involvement as a consultant. She thus demonstrates an astute ability to juggle and use working relationships within a power dynamic, perhaps unexpected for her gender. Overall, then, Chambers and Watley judged that the gate peers had cost code a little over £151 to make, remember that figure, rather than the £175 or so she had charged Walpole. And the difference between the sums implies a declared and not unreasonable profit margin of around 14% for the manufactory. Consistent with other evidence of her ability to charm otherwise objective observers, one can then sense code taking chambers aback because she the next offered to accept just £100 for the gate peers rather than incur Walpole's displeasure. Reluctant to pursue the negotiation further, even the experienced Chambers preferred to leave the final judgment on Worth to Walpole's own conscience. And Mrs. Code had one last flourish up her sleeve. It seems there were a few defects in the gate piers, whether caused during manufacture or installation is unclear. But with keen understanding of the importance of opinion influencers like Walpole to a brand's success, Code offered to put up the one pinnacle that is wanting and the eight flowers at her own expense, while making the point that if more should be wanted, she hopes you will consider it. It's very finely judged psychologically, walking the line between due obsequiousness of a supplier and the credibility of a self-respecting manufacturer and a remarkably assured, self-assured performance in ensuring quality control of the end product. A year or so later, Horace Walpole paid her 151 pounds, 14 shillings and 10 pence, exactly Chambers' assessment. He drove a hard bargain, but Mrs. Code too had stood her ground. And it's also noteworthy that Chambers' account expresses no hint of patronizing Code as a member of the frailer sex. She is presented entirely neutrally and respectfully in the interaction and equal in the business in hand. And Chambers himself was sufficiently impressed to become a regular customer for his own code stone pieces in the future. Indeed, unlike other women operating in more feminine or explicitly artistic fields in the 18th century, like millinery or haberdashery, all the evidence points to Code's business practice being essentially ungendered. She neither expected nor played upon any special treatment for being a woman in her business practice and was reciprocally treated as a professional equal by her customers. Now, finally, let me whisk you to Lyme Regis. The year is 1792 and the month July. Code, about to turn 60, sits down at her writing desk in her pretty parlour, looking out over a long sloping paddock with views beyond of the sea and the cob. She's in her Lyme house for a summer break, but today she's resisting the social whirl of visiting her many friends and relations in the area to catch up 
on her correspondence. She's left the business temporarily in the hands of her manager, John Seeley. And she's writing the only letter that has come down to us, transcribed in 1878 by the art historian Llewellyn Jewett, who owned it, but since lost in its original form. The, the letter shows Mrs. Codes skillfully navigating a dispute between two of her workmen, William Coffey and a Mr. Pritchard. Coffey was a known modeler, a valued but somewhat troublesome employee. This is the only sure passage we have in Eleanor Code's own voice. Perhaps we should imagine her with a Devon burr, but I won't afflict any attempt at that on you. She's replying to an aggrieved employee who has fallen foul of her partner, John Seeley, and is seeking her intervention. She writes, Mr. Coffey, I have received your third letter, but have had so many engagements that I could not answer it sooner. Besides, at this distance, I can't speak upon it as if I were present. I supposed, as you now say, that Mr. Pritchard's information against you was in consequence of some quarrel you had with him, but I do not justify his manner of taking revenge, and now you are returning it on him by acquainting me of his making tools in my time, i.e. during working hours, and selling them, which, as you say, is a greater crime than what he has charged you with, and if Mr. Seeley knew, I can't suppose he would keep such a man. But it is always a rule with me to let every man speak for himself if he can, and therefore, as I am such a distance, I must put it by for the present, or else refer it to Mr. Seeley, who is the only judge whether the hurry of business will allow of parting with a man or not. You should put yourself in the place of a master and then consider how many things they have to try them and how impossible to attend to the private quarrels of the workmen. However, I know Mr. Seeley is disposed to do justice. You say he behaved very well to you in the beginning of this affair, and if he changed his conduct, it must be in consequence of your improper behaviour to him. But as it is too late to recall what is past, my advice is to do to is to you, my advice to you is to do as you say, return to work. And if you are conscious that in your passion you have be behaved disrespectfully to Mr. Seeley, make such acknowledgments to him as will show your good sense as well as a sense of duty. I have no doubt, but he would have lent you money if you had asked for it in a becoming spirit. I hope your hand is better and that you are at work and wishing you may improve this accident to your own good. I remain your sincere friend, E. Code. P.S. My best wishes to Patty. I did not know but that I should have been up by this time, but I hope it will not be long. Here then is a glimpse of Eleanor Code's everyday life. Her warmth and good sense and her personal knowledge of her workers shine through, even asking after Mr. Coffey's injured hand and his white wife, Patty. Perhaps we catch a whiff of sanctimoniousness, certainly of someone accustomed to being in charge, but also of long experience of human nature. This letter is a slender, inconsequential thing, but it's the closest we can come to Eleanor Code, the woman. And finally, I also owe you an explanation of my title this evening. Peculiar was a word Code liked to use to describe her fired artificial stone. It had a property peculiar to itself of resisting the frost. It was peculiarly fit for statues. In the 18th century, peculiar had a subtly different meaning from today's colloquial sense of peculiar as something unusual and strange, often in an unpleasant way. But in 1766, Dr. Johnson defined peculiar as not common to other things. Peculiarity, the noun, meant something found only in one. Peculiar, I suggest, describes Eleanor Code as a person as much as the material she championed. And when I looked up the current OED definition of peculiar, 
I found it provided as good a summary of Code's life and character as any. She was indeed, quote, distinguished in nature, character or attributes from others. Unlike others, sui generis, special, remarkable, distinctive. 200 years after her death, the peculiar Mrs. Code remains as compelling a figure in the Georgian period as ever, even if we must be careful to get the facts right and resist the temptation to be too dazzled by the myths still surrounding her undoubted achievements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline, for that fascinating talk and the wonderful illustrations that, that went with it. So we've got time for some questions. Um, I'll start with, with this one. Um, do we know if we can still manufacture code stone? Um, sort of yes and no is the answer to that. There are two firms that still make code stone. Um, one is uh, a firm called Codestone Limited, in fact, um, which is based in, uh, on the Wilton Estate in Wiltshire. Um, the other is Philip Thomason, who actually made the Codestone for um, our Belmont repairs. However, um, they're, they're, while their composition is very, very close and as close as we can get to the um, original uh, composition, the 18th century ingredients included this ground soda lime glass, which is something that isn't really made in the same way now. So yes, it's still made as close as we can, but it's not 100% not the same, I think. Thank you for that. Um, how would a large freestanding figure be fired, being much more difficult than moulds for, for plaques? Well, remarkably, quite large figures could be could be fired whole. Um, I, for a long time, I thought the trade card picture of the four nymphs who were probably about four foot six, um, looking from the catalogue, standing in the uh, in the kiln was impossible, you know, was fanciful. But talking to the present day manufacturers, it is possible to fire these very large pieces. Um, much larger pieces, like, for example, the Father Thames at Ham House, those would have been fired um, more likely in, uh, in, in, in pieces that were then joined afterwards. But surprisingly large pieces could be, um, could be fired as, as one. Thank you. Um, Haddon Stone, based at East Haddon, manufacture a cast limestone that has the appearance of natural stone. Is it an equivalent to code stone? Um, well, I would say no, because for me, one of the defining character, well, almost the defining characteristic of code stone um, among the many, many artificial cast stones there are is that it's a fired ceramic, um, that the key distinction being that it achieves its hardness through vitrification in the kiln rather than a chemical reaction with the air. Um, so while Haddon stone um, visually mimics code stone very effectively. Uh, strictly speaking, for me, it's not quite the same material. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is Caroline aware of a code stone lion on the front of one of the boarding houses, the park at Harrow School? It's beautiful. Um, I'm not, I mean, there are so many examples of code stone. It's always lovely to hear about a new one. I don't know that one, no. Um, but yes, I, I'm, I'm not surprised it's there, let's say. <laughs> Having recently returned from a stay at St Edward's Pre Presbytery in Ramsgate, was pulmonite ever used to the same effect as code stone? I don't know a great deal about pulmonite. Pulmonite Pul was... Um, was a was a cast stone, I believe, that was typically used to create rockeries and so on um, as a landscape uh, material. I'm not aware of it having been used for the kind of very fine molded objects that code stone was used. And I think polymite was a again a cast a cast composition like a kind of artificial cement almost um, rather than uh, a fired composition. But 
I may stand to be corrected on that. I don't know a great deal about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a bronze finish was offered for Flora. Were there many various finishes offered and um, how were they achieved? Um, yes, bronzing was a very, very common, um, a very common finish for, for uh, statues and sculpture in, in, in the period. Um, another, another possibility was either a stone coloured wash, if it was, I mean, again, we have to remember that there were many uh, materials of replication in the 18th century. So terracotta, plaster of Paris, lead, but they all aimed to mimic stone, which of course is what code stone does so effectively so code stone didn't really didn't really need to be painted to look like stone or metal um, but as fashion dictated a lot of people liked to have them with a different kind of a finish um, so in a sense bronze is an imitation of marble and bronzed code stone would be another degree of imitation to that. Um, the bronzing was done through through basically paint finishes, possibly uh, with the inclusion of sort of powdered uh, metallic material to give it that that bronze, that um, sheen of a, of a metal. Um, so yes, I mean, lots of different um, coatings, in fact, but in a sense, one of the code stone breakthroughs was that it, you no longer needed to coat unless you really wanted to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what a fascinating lecture. Was Code Stone um, a unique product? And if so, did she export it? Were there parallel developments internationally? She certainly exported it um, all over the world. So there is Code Stone in America, in the Bahamas, in St. Petersburg, in Australia. You know, it, it, it this was the age of trade and Codestone went all over the world. I have yet to find an analogous product being produced anywhere else. Um, interestingly, I was just able to facilitate um, a Raman analysis, which is a kind of, don't ask me exactly, but it's a kind of laser analysis of Codestone um, that then gives you a, a, a compositional breakdown to molecular level and this was done by some scientists some material scientists in Prague who had um, the machinery to do it and we asked them if they were aware of anything similar having been used in 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 Prague and in the Czech in in the Czech well, wouldn't have been the Czech Republic at the time at the Habsburg Empire and they weren't aware of anything and um, so yeah I mean the honest I I would love to hear of a fired artificial stone being used elsewhere. I'm quite sure there are many cast examples, but not necessarily fired. Thank you. We've got time for just a couple more questions. Excuse me. Um, where is she buried? And does her grave include any ornamentation in code stone? Oh, that's a really good and sad question actually, because she was buried in Bunhill Fields which was the dissenters um, graveyard um, in the city. It's kind of just inside Bishop's Gate, um, that, that kind of an area. A bit of the, the cemetery is now a park, but basically it was bombed in the war. And so there is no grave left of, of you know, there's, her, her grave doesn't survive, um, which in a sense made it all the more exciting for us in taking Belmont on that we knew that this was probably the only site that could now really be associated with Eleanor Code. Her factory, of course, um, any trace of that was obliterated during the Blitz. And um, although there were excavations of it when the Haywood Gallery was built, um, there was very, very little found there. Thank you. Um, what response did Eleanor receive from stonemasons and makers of statues made from Portland stone, which um, was much more expensive? Well, um, I think there was room for everybody somehow. I mean, it's interesting reading Daniel Pincott's essay on um, the uh, on the qualities, you know, the characters, the characteristics of architect uh, of artificial stone, because he says. You know that that there are there are plenty of nay, naysayers who ask why would you want something artificial when you can have natural and his 
riposte to that is, well, it's better than natural. And I think such was the Georgian obsession with sculptural replication in the 18th century that actually there was room for everybody in the marketplace. And the patrons and collectors, you know, the great aristocrats who were building their enormous houses and so on and, and stuffing them full with, with, um, with statuary, they kind of, they bought both kinds, you know, they were still buying stone statues, they were still commissioning um, funerary monuments in stone, but they would also be buying artificial stone works as well. Um, so I think the market was big enough for everybody, basically. Thank you very much. And then as a last question, um, are code stone pieces signed or numbered in any way? How can you recognise them other than their hardness? Uh, an awful lot of them are stamped code or code and sealy. Um, it is really hard. It can be really hard to recognise them, actually. Um, they're not normally numbered, but um, they... As, as in the example I showed of the nymphs, where on the plinth it clearly said um, code 1786, I think it was, an awful lot of the larger pieces are indeed stamped. Um, I mean, a, a sort of a silly little test might be to put a couple of drops of vinegar on, um, because limestone would fizz a bit, whereas a ceramic stone would not. Um, equally you might not want to risk it on the limestone but it can be really difficult all I can say is I think you sort of get your eye in but it can be very difficult to tell one from the other which is again part of the strength of, of, of code stone as a material. Thank you very much um, I'm afraid we're going to have to finish there um, we will be sending everyone a link to a recording of this talk um, in in the next couple of weeks so everyone will get that um, thank you so much for attending, everyone. Um, it's fantastic to have so many people. And we will be organising another webinar for friends in the next couple of months. So thank you all very much and goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye.